everyone. I'm Kayla J. Smith. And if you're just joining us, welcome. If you've been with us all day, thank you. And we've made it to our last panel titled Alumni Doing the Work. So our first alumni panelist is my dear friend, Naja Zigby Johnson. Naja was born and raised in Harlem, New York City, and is committed to Black power and building social movements through cultural and civic engagement work. Naja is a graduate of Guilford College and most recently of Harvard Divinity School, where she explored Black American social movement history and Black cultural production as a presidential scholar. Naja co-founded and led the popular education student-led course, Freedom School, a seminar on theory, theory and practice for Black students, sorry, excuse me, a theory and practice for Black studies in the United States while at Harvard. She also co-edited the Joining Freedom School magazine. In addition to her academic background, Naja is a product of the Southern Youth Organizing Institute, Ignite North Carolina where she was heavily involved in statewide organizing efforts around the movement for Black Lives. Currently, Naja is back in her, is, ooh, currently, Naja is back in Harlem, her forever home, with the Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz Memorial and Education Center, where she is helping to formally restart and grow the Institute as the Director of the Institutional Advancement. Welcome, Naja. Thank you so much, Kayla. So our next alumni panelist is Mohamedou Jean. Mohamedou Jean is a Muslim chaplain and diversity educator with over a decade of experience promoting interfaith and cultural engagement at both liberal arts and Ivy League institutions. After earning a bachelor's in psychology from Carlson College and a master of divinity from Harvard Divinity School, Mohamedou broke ground as the first Muslim to serve in a general chaplain role at an Ivy League institution where he became assistant chaplain at Columbia University. There, he supported student-led religious organizations with the creation, promotion, execution, and evaluation of their various activities and initiatives. He then went on to become Bucknell University's inaugural chaplain for the Muslim community where he initiated a structure of support and guidance for Muslim students, faculty, and staff. Following his outstanding and highly praised work in increasing the size and engagement of the Muslim populations at each institution, Muhammadu was elected to the board of the Association of Muslim Chaplains at its inaugural communications chair. He now works at the University of Southern Maine and lives in, Sort in South Portland, Maine. Welcome, Mohamedou. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Our next alumni panelist is New York State Assemblywoman, Dr. Mateo Frontis, who represents the 46th Assembly District in Brooklyn, New York. She served on six committees, including aging, children and families, economic development, job creation, commerce and industry, mental health, tourism, parks, arts and sports development, and transportation. Assemblywoman Francis has a BS in social work and MSW from NYU, an MA in psychology from Teachers College, Columbia University, an MTS from Harvard Divinity School, and a PhD from the Columbia University School of Social Work. She has been an adjunct assistant professor at Columbia University School of Social Work since 2016, where she's taught advocacy and social work practice, changing organizations and communities, influencing social policies and political processes, and stigma and mental health. And at NYU Silver School of Social Work since 2008, where she's taught advocacy and social justice and social work practice and political social work for advocacy and social change. Before her elect election to the New York State Assembly in November 2018, Mathilde was a community organizer and nonprofit leader in her community. Since 2004, she has founded a social service agency, two anti-gun violence coalitions, and an independent democratic club. She has also helped form the Coney Island Clergy Coalition, a network of religious leaders who provide mental health and substance abuse referral services. 
Our final alumni panelist is Reverend Dr. Aaron McLeod. McLeod. Dr. Reverend, Reverend Dr. Aaron J. McLeod, McLeod is the servant leader of Gorham, 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 excuse me, United Methodist Church, an urban faith community serving the South Side of Chicago, Illinois. Dr. McLeod is a gifted lawyer, administrator, and social justice commentator. Dr. McLeod is a graduate of McCormick Theological Seminary, the University of Iowa College of Law, Harvard University School of Divinity, and Morehouse College. He has completed further study of Northwestern University and the University of Illinois School of Public Health. Dr. McLeod is, or is ordained clergy who has standing in the United Church of Christ. Also, Dr. McLeod is an active member of Omega Psi Fraternity Incorporated he is a Prince Hall Mason and he is a Shriner. Dr. McLeod is married to Deidre Bookham McLeod and is the proud father of Thompson Brewer McLeod. And welcome Dr. Erin and welcome Mateo. I'm sorry I didn't say that earlier. And finally- Thank we have you so our, much for having me. <laughs> yes, yes. And excuse me y'all for butchering through some of y'all intros. I, like as soon as I started, I was like, ah, so I'm, oh, my dearest apologies. Um, the moderator for this panel would be Chavis Jones. Chavis Jones is a proud graduate of Morehouse College where he studied philosophy. Chavis then obtained a Master of Divinity at Harvard Divinity School where he focused on the intersection of religion and social ethics. At Harvard, he was a fellow of the Harvard Graduate School Leadership Institute, a staff writer for the Harvard Journal of Human Rights Policy and a ministry fellow. Last year, he graduated from Duke University School of Law where he focused primarily on civil, civil and human rights issues. He was the president of the Duke Black Graduate and Professional Students Association, worked as an active investigations team member of the Duke Law Innocence Project, worked in the Wrongful Conventions Clinic, and currently serves as a national vice president of the Duke Black Alumni Association. He plans to ult ultimately use his education and life experiences to advance causes of human rights and to connect the human family. Chavis currently serves as a policy fellow at the Children's Defense Fund in Washington. Take it away Chavis and thank you all for being here. Thank you so much Kayla. Uh, I'm really grateful to be here and I'm really grateful for this conference and this space and all that it represents. Um, as I think about this particular conference, I think about the great leadership that went into making it happen on this occasion. So I thank Kayla and all the co-conveners who were a part of this. Um, and I think about the history of this conference. And so if you go back to 2016, I remember that particular moment in time. I remember the very first conference. I remember the very first meetings about that conference and the very first conversations about it coming into being. I remember all of the leadership from students uh, from Harambe, uh, the, the students of African descent at Harvard Divinity School, who have given so much guidance to this campus around what it means to honor black life and to give true meaning to uh, our brilliance, our endeavors, our strivings and our struggles. And if I could take you back just a year prior to that academic year, to the year 2014, 2015, I remember Harambe students hearing about the death of a young man in Ferguson, Missouri by the name of Michael Brown. Michael Brown's body was languishing in the streets for four hours when the whole nation heard about this young man, the 17 year old who stayed there for four hours as police officers stood watching by and his community members and friends and family washes his body literally baked in the sun for four hours while no one seemingly cared. From that Harambe students took a 20 plus hour journey to Ferguson, Missouri during the weekend of Michael Brown's funeral. We stayed there and we advocated, we, we assisted, we went to the Red Cross Center where students were needing assistance. We, we were in the streets and we marched and, and walked and gathered and we did all that we could. From that, that, that following academic year when we got back, Dean Hempton and others on the campus at Harvard Divinity School immediately asked about us. They, they texted us while we were there, they, they actually cared and there were so many things that happened in that campus over the course of the next year and the preceding years. They give face, they give voice, they give volume to the work of Harambe and of his alumni. If you remember in 2014, not only was that the, the death of Michael Brown, but we experienced the death of, of so many others, including Eric Gardner. 
where there was a non-indictment for his death, including the death of Tamir Rice. In the following year, you saw Sandra Bland and the Emanuel Nine, and, and the list literally goes on. But that year, that academic year was bookended by the tragedy of Michael Brown, and it ended with the Baltimore uprising in response to the death of Freddie Gray. And so students were grappling with what was happening all around us, the bloodshed, the, the lack of a response from the university, the, the seeming lack of a response from the government. And there was a great deal of desire to see something changed. And so, so many institutions and so many things developed on that campus spawned by students. The Racial Justice and Healing Initiative came out of that. Uh, the HDS Forum on Ferguson and Race came out of that. It was a university-wide forum that HDS students led. Um, and this conference was in the long shadow of, of this year of bloodshed, of, of Black bodies languishing across this country um, due to police violence, due to state violence and vigilante justice. When that conference took place, little did we know the very weekend that it would take place uh, would be the election of Donald J. Trump. And so over the last five years of this conference, the entirety of this conference has unfortunately been under the guise of a president who we all know is now on trial for his second impeachment. And we've been existing in a state in which our lives have been deemed unvaluable. Um, and it gives some real voice to what this conference means and the voices of the individuals that you're here following my. But Harambe students have always stood in the gap, have always cared, have always done the work, however that looks, that we've always engaged in the work. And so you'll see and hear five different iterations of the work, what it means to care, what it means to give so much of yourself to endeavoring to make the world a better place, particularly for those who find themselves situated on the margins. And so I hope uh, that you will get something from the lives of these individuals, what they've endeavored to do and how they've represented the long tradition of Harambe students engaging the world to not just be a part of the solution, but to be lights, exemplars, as the solution take hold and take shape. So it's my honor to be the moderator, and I look forward to hearing from these stories and from these individuals. With that, the very first person we'll hear is Nadja Zigby Johnson, who reminds us that she hails from Harlem. So thank you. Take it away, Nadja. Thank you so much, Chavis, and apologies for jumping in early. I was so excited, um, but that was such a beautiful introduction. To, to this panel. Um, so I'm starting out, I'm the youngest panelist and the most recent graduate of Harvard Divinity School. I had the honor of graduating um, <laughs> during COVID. And so I had one of the YouTube graduations and it was a really um, difficult time. And I think it was reflective in many ways um, of my time at Harvard, which was magnificent um, and also wildly difficult. Uh, I will never not understand and remember the ways in which Harvard reproduces evil and hegemony and white supremacy and a lot of the things that we're actively working to undo as black folks, as folks a part of the divinity community um, and beyond. Um, and also while at Harvard, I had a lot of really incredible experiences exploring black womanist theology and ethics, black culture production, um, and also Black social movement history. Particularly, I was moved by the work of the Movement for Black Lives and Ferguson organizing that happened. Um, and I really wanted to take my time while at Harvard to think through these, these, these historic events that shape Blackness in real time, both at a sociopolitical level, a cultural level, and also at, at a religious and spiritual level. Um, and Interestingly enough, uh, just a few weeks before COVID hit, I took a class um, with some of my peers who were on this call organizing the event um, called Coloniality, Catastrophe, and Race. And it couldn't have been a more timely course that I took um, because everything would change after that class. And, and during that time, I got to I think a lot about what it meant to live through catastrophe and what it meant to really re-envision the worlds that we needed to live in in order to sustain ourselves and to survive as people um, not knowing how to be in right relationship with the world. Um, and so while in the first few weeks of quarantine um, and COVID, I thought a lot about my time 
um, in that class and what we had thought about. I thought about catastrophe. And I also thought about a lot of the organizing and movement work that had taken place last spring. Um, I thought about the, the uh, brilliant work of um, thinkers like Robin D.G. Kelly, who writes about Afro-surrealism and abolition. I thought about the work of Jackie Wang, who I believe just received her doctorate from Harvard, and she writes a brilliant book called Carceral Capitalism. I thought about people like Angela Davis and a lot of my peers who were and are theorizing not only about the ways in which abolition is uh, a conceptual framework or a goal that we're working to achieve, but a social justice ideological model that we can use in our everyday lives. Um, and there's this one quote by Robin D.G. Kelly um, that Jackie Wang uses in her book, uh, Carceral Capitalism. And Robin says, what shall we build on the ashes of a nightmare? And it was that quote that animated a lot of my thinking last spring in terms of what I wanted to be a part of. Um, and I knew for me that this work meant rebuilding our community, rebuilding society, both at a global and local level, um, and, and really re-educating folks um, so that we could activate the sort of future that was necessary and that is necessary because it was so abundantly clear um, through COVID, through organizing, through police violence, which is really as American as apple pie, that what we have doesn't work. Um, and, and that was what I was left with after completing my degree um, at HDS. And I remember one day sitting down uh, while I was deep in this new political iteration of my political education and development, thinking about Malcolm X. And I happened to be watching the Who Killed Malcolm X documentary series, which I imagine some of you have seen. And I had also just received the book, Those Who Don't Know Say by Dr. Garrett Felber, who's another incredible professor. Um, down south. And it was in that moment that I was sitting next to my book and I was watching this uh, documentary series that I got a call asking if I'd wanted, if I wanted to um, apply to work with the Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz Memorial and Educational Center in Harlem. And I felt like the most divinely inspired moment for me. It felt like an affirmation that I was in the right place, that I was doing the right things, but that most importantly, I was listening to my ancestors because part of my spiritual practice is listening to my ancestors, letting my ancestors guide me. And so it felt so good to get that affirmation. Um, and it felt like more than I could have asked for to be a, to be a part of the work um, that the Shabazz Center wanted to start, which was to reignite this organization that's been around at the Autobahn Ballroom, the site of Malcolm X's death um, and the site of the last year of his organizing work in Harlem. And so of course I said, yes, and it was the only thing <laughs> that you know occupied my thoughts because it would allow me to really think about turning the sort of freedom school work that I was doing um, at Harvard in, into a praxis, into an everyday praxis in my community with my folks. Um, and it would allow me to be a part of the work of reactivating such a historic legacy. Um, and what felt more exciting uh, or equally exciting is that I got to start that work on the day of my birthday, which was another divinely inspired uh, day in many ways. And, and so right now I'm six months into my work um, at the Shabazz Center. And I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing um, because it's so important for so many reasons um, beyond any one individual, I think. A lot of folks know Malcolm X and they know uh, who he was as a minister with the Nation of Islam and they know about him through that lens. But fewer folks know the Malcolm uh, who, who was gl globalized and had an international lens, particularly because of the sort of work that he was a part of in the last year and a half of his life. Um, in 1964, he made Hajj and he spent a lot of time on the continent uh, learning from other leaders who were heading uh, decolonial movements on the continent. And particularly, he was able to work with the Organization for African Unity, which was an organization comprised of different African nations who were in the process of really activating anti-colonial movement work on the continent. And Malcolm took this concept and brought it back to Harlem and started the Organization for Afro-American Unity, which in many ways had the same vision 
of challenging empire, challenging white supremacy, which he now understood to be a global existential and physical threat to not just black folks, but to everyone. Um, and, and the OAAU was the secular counterpart to a mosque, a Sunni mosque that Malcolm founded also in Harlem, which still exists to this day. And Malcolm organized with the OAAU at the Shabazz Center for eight months until his death. Um, he was actually giving a talk to OAAU members the day that he was killed, which is coming up on February 21st. Um, and I share this because for us and for me, being able to excavate Malcolm's ideological vision with the OAAU, which sought to explore the importance of Black culture production, Black arts, education, self-preservation and defense, anti-capitalism, but also building Black wealth within our communities um, is almost uncomfortably true to this day because all of what Malcolm thought and all of what he put forth continues to remain relevant. And so in so many ways, we're continuing to pull these gems from history and activate them in real time for the use um, of future generations and in partnerships uh, in partnership with organizations like the Movement for Black Lives, Dream Defenders, Black Men Build, um, and a host of other organizers who are really thinking about doing this work of rebuilding um, our society when the ashes have settled. And I also do a lot of very nuts and bolts stuff that's necessary for building organizations, but I think it's really beautiful to be a part of this work because in many ways um, I'm thinking about what does it mean to use an abolitionist framework and ethic when rebuilding and rethinking about an organization. And, 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 and in many ways, I don't believe that the nonprofit industrial complex serves folks. I don't believe it serves black folks. And I don't believe that it really offers sustainable, equitable liberation because we're always wholly dependent on someone else for our resources. And so I think that them, the Shabazz Center deciding that they were gonna hire a millennial, a 26 year old to take charge um, and to be in many ways at the head of this work was also an affirmation that young folks um, in this emerging generation needs to be at the forefront of movement work and that we need to be thoughtfully um, taking the baton from our elders and really ensuring that institutional and historical knowledge is being passed and also activated. Um, and so that's a lot of what I'm doing. Um, and, and it's, it's incredible because it feels like I really am, I'm, I'm thinking and I'm heeding the call that Robin D.G. Kelly um, said when he, when he wrote, What Shall We Build on the Ashes of a Nightmare? And I wanna end my uh, remarks with another quote from Robin, which is re his response to this question that he poses. He says, I won't propose much since the design and realization of such a space ought to be the product of a collective imagination, shaped and reshaped by the very process of turning rubble and memory into the seeds of a new society. And that quote feels so apt and so pertinent to my life because it feels like getting to work with the Shabazz Center is, is heeding uh, Robin's call and it's turning the memory that we have into, into active seeds and really building the sort of community that we need in order to move forward um, in sustainability and in equity um, and in justice. And so I'm just grateful to share just a bit about what I'm doing um, post HDS and I'm excited to hear what others have done and I'm grateful to be a part of this panel discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nadja, and thank you for your work that truly highlights the work of the ancestors that honors people like Septima Quintet Clark and Fannie Lou Hamer with the Freedom Schools. And then you transition to thinking about uh, Malcolm X and so many others who stood alongside him. And you're excavating that work and bringing new life to it and breathing new life to it. So we appreciate you for, for that. Our next panelist will be Mohamedou Gian. And so we look forward to hearing from him. Thank you. Thank you so much. And good job, Chavis. A lot of African Americans and Americans in general struggle with my last name, but you did very well. Thank you. Um, as a former um, co-chair of Harambe when I was a student at HDS, I, I want to just reiterate how proud and impressed I am with all the organizers who um, worked so hard to put this conference together. This is way beyond what we were able to do when we were there. And so I'm just in awe and honored and humbled. Thank you. And thank you for thinking of me to be included in this panel. Um, 
HDS was a very uh, powerful and enriching experience for me, both in the classroom and outside the classroom. Um, I got very lucky. Um, I actually, I don't believe in luck. I think this, or coincidences, this was a divine um, intervention. The same exact semester that I started at HDS in fall of 2012, coincided with the start of a man named Usman Khan, who um, was at Columbia and then came to HDS, who was a specialist in Islam and African religions, which is what I came wanting to study. And so to have that kind of symbiotic uh, relationship and resource already there was, was a true gift. Um, most of my courses were with him. He was my thesis advisor and a significant portion of my um, academic and intellectual pursuit stemmed from that. Outside the classroom, Chavis mentioned some of this. Um, Black Lives Matter was in peak uh, shape and form. Um, I was never that kid who went to protests, but I went to more protests uh, in the 2013, 2014 time uh, then than I had done my entire life. And to this day, I still haven't matched the amount of protests I had been to because I was just so shook and affected by the visual of Black people getting so brutally um, who their lives so brutally ended um, in front of everyone and have the people responsible for ending those lives um, not face any kind of consequences. And so I was carrying those two things as I was journeying through HDS. Um, and I carried this light, I would call it light. It's dark, but it's light as well um, in my work uh, as a chaplain subsequently. Though HDS was a very amazing experience, there were several gaps that I observed as I served as a chaplain at multiple institutions that it didn't quite exactly prepare me for. And I wanna spend some, of, some time now um, addressing those gaps. And the first thing um, is the curriculum. It was focused on the academic study of religion, um, which it does extremely well, as well as the arts of ministry, public speaking, public leadership, um, denominational polity and a variety of other things, um, just off the top of my head, what I remember. Um, and that was great, but it didn't necessarily align with the changing needs and times of Muslims uh, today in college environments. And some of those needs did stem from the reality that 97% or so of Muslims in the US, actually 90%, I'm sorry, come from immigrant backgrounds. Um, myself included, I was born and raised in Senegal, West Africa, and I'm happy to see that some of my relatives from Senegal are here in, this, in, the, in, the, in the audience. Um, and Senegal is a uniquely positioned country, which I'll discuss later. But there are 49 Muslim countries globally, and I'm defining Muslim country as a country where more than 50 or 50% 50 or more of its citizens are Muslims. Senegal is 95% Muslim. A solidly Muslim country. India is 80% non-Muslim, but has as many Muslims as Pakistan, which is about 100% Muslim. So that makes Pakistan a Muslim country, but not India. Not a perfect scenario, but you know what I'm, you see what I'm saying. The immigrant experience is strong within the Muslim communities at most colleges. And with each of these countries, they have their own set of interpretations of Islamic scripture and how they shape the societies that they live in, the way that men and women are positioned, the way children are raised, the way food is eaten, but also what weight of religious righteousness is given in a specific context over others. As a Senegalese Muslim, hospitality, treatment of different people and just a welcoming uh, presence of all people is strongly, strongly emphasized. And what I've seen as a chaplain is that in some other cultures, dietary requirements, halal and, um, oh, halal and haram foods to eat, halal meaning lawful and haram meaning forbidden, that is more emphasized and vice versa. So one of the challenges that um, many Muslims face, but especially Muslim chaplains is, by being the sole Muslim chaplain at their institutions, they have to minister to all this diversity, which I didn't even mention the racial diversity. What's unique about Islam in America as well is that there isn't a dominant racial group 
different Protestant denominations, the Jewish faith, um, they all have one racial dominating um, demographic. In Islam, it's about a quarter black, um, about a third uh, South Asian, Arab, and then about 10% white, and then a few percentages um, that are about, I'm sorry, about two thirds South Asian and, and Arab. And then the rest is a mixture of, of um, Latinx converts, Native American converts and white converts. So you have the immigrants and then you have the converts. So there's isolation and marginalization on both sides. Oh, I realize I'm already close to time. Okay. So I, one chaplain has to oversee all of that. A second barrier that HDS did not uh, prepare me for, the color of my skin and my national origin. As the Senegalese West African Muslim, we do things in a very specific way. And when you are, and also there is a history of enslaving people who look like me in many of these Muslim countries um, that are in like Mauritania, India and places like that. Sorry, India is not a Muslim country, but you know what I mean. The transatlantic slave trade and then, the, and then the Indian slave trade was prominent. So there is this inherited perception of inferiority of black people that gets manifested theologically in the, in the fact that um, a lot of, in Saudi Arabia where the authority of printing Qur'ans in different languages is held, are refusing to print Qur'ans in African languages, um, for example. And that's a real obstacle when you're coming into a campus where the majority of the Muslim population is international and already carries a lot of anti-Black uh, bias towards you who is in charge. So I face some resistance there. And, but to be more sympathetic, the resistance was also justified in that my start and continuation in chaplaincy also coincided with the rise of the, the person who was at the White House before the current guy we've had for about a month. And there was a rhetoric of Muslims are bad, Muslims need to be banned from coming into this country. Um, and seven Muslim countries ended up being forbidden to enter the United States. Like that, that was a success, which was shocking and terrifying. And so what, what did that bring? A level of anxiety, congregational anxiety, uh, hard divisions, black and white thinking, and an inability and resistance to exploring true learning and imagination because it became about survival. And when you're in survival mode, it's very difficult to internalize new information. It's very difficult to impart the fact that Islam is a very broad, diverse, inclusive religion when people just want right and wrong. And usually right means what they do back home is right. What everybody else does is wrong. And so that was another barrier, but it was an understandable one again, because your anxiety does things to your brain, it shrinks. And so how do I navigate that as a chaplain? Not become the anxious presence that your congregation is. And so that would mean not necessarily establishing a barrier, but knowing where you start and where you end and not taking on and becoming um, the thing that you're supposed to be ministering to. And so that's been a huge lesson from HDS that I was very thankful for. Um, but one community that I didn't experience the anxiety um, stood in contrast to the colleges that I served. And that was the Association of Muslim Chaplains. As um, Kayla read in my bio, I ultimately was elected to that position um, after, shortly after I, I left my last chaplaincy position. And that was because the contrast in experiences was so different. These were religious professionals who had all received the same training I had. The majority of the organization was black chaplains um, because before um, Muslim chaplains started getting trained at seminaries with MDivs and stuff, it was mostly uh, African-American uh, chaplains who were just doing the work in prisons. Prison chaplaincy was the original Muslim chaplaincy. And then it branched out to hospital chaplaincy, um, um, 
college chaplaincy, community chaplaincy, even uh, law enforcement chaplaincy, and now corporate chaplaincy, <laughs> which is actually, I would love to transition into that, but that's a different story. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, it's just been, it's just been interesting seeing a lot of, of challenges, but also a lot of growth. And I will just end by saying that um, stepping away from chaplaincy, um, you know, I was ready to just transition to a more general role, but then I see that we're in a global pandemic. And as you read in my bio, I now work as an admissions counselor and admissions counselors travel. We travel to different high schools all over the country and we tell students, you should come to our college because it's the best one, right? Not being able to do that and suddenly being tied to the screen. Um, and then the pandemic coinciding with the second iteration of Black Lives Matter, um, I'm starting, suddenly starting to get more offers. Different chaplains, different mosques suddenly want a black imam or chaplain to come speak to them about race and Islam. So I started getting all these bookings all of a sudden. And because I don't have to travel and I just have to log on, I'm able to attend to them. Uh, I also, and this inspired me to go back to school. So I started a doctorate of ministry at the Pacific School of Religion that I suspended in favor of a master's in Islamic leadership at Boston Theological Seminary. And it's teaching me a lot of the religious content that I didn't initially have um, at HDS, which I'm very grateful for. And as of last month, I just became a wedding officiant for the Muslim wedding service, which was started in NYU. And I have my first wedding this weekend, which is between a Senegalese and an African-American uh, man and woman, which I'm very, very excited about. Um, and yeah, I'm just really, really thankful for this opportunity. 90% um, of what I wanted to say, I didn't get to say, but hopefully you appreciated what I shared. Thank you so much, Mohamedou, for your trailblazing work in, in Muslim chaplaincy um, and for really being at the nexus of that work in a very important time. We, we understand the last five years have been difficult with Muslim bans and the like. So we thank you for that. And we thank our first two panelists for starting us off in excellent fashion, Naj and, and Mohamedou. And so now we'll get to our last two panelists, uh, Assemblywoman Mathilde Frontis. We'd love to hear from you about your work. Thank you. Sure, and thank you again, Chavez, for having me. I'm just sitting here with a really big grin on my face. Um, I sent some greetings in French to the relatives of uh, Mohamedou uh, and told them bienvenue. So I hope that, they're, that they saw my comment. Uh, just really kind of beaming with a lot of pride um, at what I see here tonight. Um, I see Reverend McLeod shaking his head. Um, he and I were students at uh, HDS approximately 20 years ago. Um, I was there from 2000 <clears throat> to 2002. And I think about what brought me there, uh, the work that we did when we were in Harambe and seeing what Harambe has become. I, I just feel very hopeful and very happy to see that the work continues and there's a whole new generation. Admittedly, I, I, I'm not terribly happy because I realize I'm getting older and there's a whole new generation now, but it's all with, uh, with fondness. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to reflect out loud about my work. You know, one of the things that excited me when I got the invitation to talk on this panel was just the framing of it and this idea of like alumni doing the work. Uh, I often joke that in the African-American community, we use a lot of buzzwords with each other, you know, when we see each other in the street and we're like, how's it going brother? What's, what's going on? And we'll say like, I'm in the struggle, you know how we do, you know, <laughs> or things like that. But what does that mean? You know, what does the work mean? Um, and I think for me, I'll sort of keep it brief, mindful of the time, and then would love to hear any questions. I want to say that sometimes, you know, decisions that we're born into obviously shape the trajectory of our life's path. And whenever I talk about my life's work, I often start with the fact that I'm a daughter of Haitian immigrants. I'm a first generation American who was born to um, a 27 year old uh, couple who had just gotten married and were not from the US and had to learn everything from scratch. And they came here in search of the American dream. Uh, and we, I was born in Brooklyn in Crown Heights, uh, but my mom and dad moved to Coney Island in 1985 where they came to purchase their first home, which again is part of the American dream home ownership. And in moving to Coney Island in 1985, I was the eldest of their four kids. I was seven years old. 
And I often think of my life's work beginning as that young girl that moved to Coney Island at seven years old. I was very observant and was always, you know, looking around me and trying to make sense of the world that I was in. And I noticed right away when we moved to Coney Island, I was just fascinated by the kind of community that it was. You know, Coney Island is a place that is his world, which is known worldwide for its amusement. You know, people know us because of our amusement park, because of our roller coaster, because of the beach and boardwalk. But few people know about the community that is right behind the amusement park. And um, I remember vividly, you know, um, hearing gunshots, you know, things like that. I grew up in the time when prostitution was sort of, you know, had a hold on New York City. And I remember sort of what it took to sort of uh, work through that over the years. But I always viewed those issues in terms of the sort of um, disparities that Black people have faced over the years. And even as a child, and when I started high school at 12 years old, I remember speaking to the adult in my school and asking questions and saying, you know, I want to help my community. You know, I want to do some work in the tradition of Malcolm X. Uh, really happy to hear Nasha's comments tonight. I have been talking about Malcolm for many years since I was a preteen and saying, you know, I just, that's the vision that I had in my mind for myself. And I think that that was the universe's way of just saying that that was my calling, that I knew from the time I was a child that I was born to be an activist. Because what could you possibly know about that as a child? I didn't know what being an activist was, but that's my understanding of myself that I had as a little girl without re even really understanding the full implications. So that's kind of what set me off to my journey, a combination of living in a historically marginalized community with a lot of poverty, a lot of crime, and really trying to make sense of that. But then knowing that when I traveled to other neighborhoods that things were a little different and I saw people getting treated differently. And uh, from there, I majored in social work because I understood that to be a sort of platform that could help me uh, get the tools that I need to give back to my community. And um, I just started on this upward trajectory of going to the NYU School of Social Work. I came to HDS at the very young age of 22. I, was, I did my third master's then because I knew that I eventually wanted to do a PhD. And back then, uh, in the year was 2000, I had done some research at Columbia Teachers College before I came to Harvard, looking at religiosity and spirituality in terms of its protective factors. You know, I was doing some research with some scholars at TC, which found that youth which had, you know, who had faith or who had aspects of religiosity, that that was able to serve as a buffer to many of the issues that they were dealing with in their life. And that just really fascinated me. So that's, I came to, to Harvard on that sort of academic bent, but it turned out to be so much more than that. And what I'll say is that since then, um, HDS really gave me the sort of scholarship access to, you know, a university where I could see myself, look in the mirror and see myself as a young a scholar, as a thinker, as a person who read as many books as I could get my hands on to understand more in terms of the plight of people of African descent. And the minute I got back home, I just fully embraced that role of an activist. Um, I would was involved in anything that you can think of. Even when I was at HDS, I don't know if some of my uh, former classmates remember, I was always sort of volunteering, looking for projects to be a part of. I had volunteered in Mattapan and had found a nonprofit organization to help out at called Caribbean U-Turn. They offered me a job and I stayed in Boston two years longer because they wouldn't let me go, even though I had just wanted to volunteer. So once I got back to New York, I found myself really rolling up my sleeves, starting nonprofit organizations in my community, becoming an anti-gun violence advocate. And people say, Matilda, you're scared of your shadow. How did you get to do anti-gun violence work? You're not a tough person at all. And I said, look, it's not about that. It's just about, you know, the work that needs to be done in our communities of healing, of becoming whole. Many of our neighborhoods across this country are still reeling from institutionalized and systemic racism, from redlining, from neglect. 
And a lot of people don't realize that the disparities that we see in these urban communities were man-made. We weren't born to live that way. They were literally manufactured by the American government who helped white immigrants when they got here, who helped poor white immigrants get their footing. And the government gave poor white immigrants a helping hand and made sure that they had money to go to school, made sure that they were able to buy homes and made sure that they had nice suburban communities with manufactured lawns and made sure that they could go to school and do certain things. And while it was doing that, it literally oppressed uh, people of African descent and did not give us those same opportunities. And so a lot of times when we throw words around and we say the ghetto, the hood, or who wants to live there, I wouldn't be caught dead there. You know, we shouldn't talk like that about our own neighborhoods because we are the ones who have to fix our own communities and advocate uh, for our own people. So it's just really been uh, really an honor and a, pr a privilege uh, over the last few years to be hands-on in more ways than one. Um, starting all sorts of groups. I'm born to be a community organizer. I think that it's a gift that I have to bring people together. If you put me in a room with 100 people, by the time we're done, I would have gotten the mothers together, the dads, I would have organized the kids. <laughs> you know, everybody's going to have a project. Everybody's going to have something to do. Um, and then the projects, they stay and they grow and they flourish. And it's really just been a deep sense of honor to see that all these years, many of the things that I've personally founded, that I've been a part of, that they're still here, they're still serving others. Um, and that was the foundation that I used to spring into politics. So now that I'm in this new chapter of my life as a state lawmaker, as a legislator, I see this as just another iteration of everything that I've been doing. It's another way to help <clears throat> my community, to help my people to use, as I like to say, the halls of government, uh, which historically were used to oppress people. And now we have to use those same halls of government uh, to liberate people and to pass policies to promote equality. Um, so that's just a little snippet in terms of how I got here. Um, and I think I see myself as just an ongoing agent for change. And I'm always sort of having my hand in different things to uh, push our people together for collective uh, well being. Thank you so much, Matilde, and for your excellent work and uh, for your engagement in community and being really passionate about service. Uh, I think it's really resonant for a lot of people in the conversation that, that you've engaged in so many forms of service and that you've built things. Um, it's an important aspect and that you've also turned back to community. And so I hope that's a, a resonating feature of, of this conversation and a thread that comes through our first three panelists, their, their real engagement with people and communities that look like them, who have experiences like them, and, and those who don't. Um, so thank you for that. Our last panelist is Dr. Aaron McLeod. And so we look forward to hearing from him. Thank you, Travis. Uh, so humbled to be here. So uh, happy to see my uh, dear sister, my colleague, we came in uh, to HDS um, at the same time. And uh, I am just so impressed with all the wonderful things that she is doing. As I was impressed with her the first time that I met her. Uh, we were the same age, but she had finished college at the age of 16 and had already earned uh, two masters by the time I had earned one bachelor's degree. But uh, she and uh, other colleagues like uh, Dr. Avery and uh, Dr. Angelette uh, Tucker and C. Douglas Hollis, we were Harambe. And uh, mm -hmm. we had been we accountable and uh, we served uh, nobly. We had our, our hard discussions, but more importantly, we were there to thrive with one another, to encourage one another uh, along our respective journeys and our respective paths. Uh, nonetheless, I am humbled to know him to be able to share on uh, this panel. Uh, to meet and interact uh, with our brothers and sisters. Uh, I remember uh, seeing uh, Brother Jones uh, when he was at Harvard, he came down to the Proctor Conference and uh, we connected with uh, the other brothers following uh, when he came down. I am uh, the story of a black person matriculating through Harvard Divinity School at the turn of the century uh, who was struggling with vocation, quite honestly. Uh, I majored in uh, business at Morehouse uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, and I came uh, to uh, Harvard Divinity School just really open to have a new 
and diverse experience um, within a theological education that would propel me uh, forward. What I thought would be in the academy, which turned out to uh, ultimately uh, land me in the parish, which I was really running from at the time of graduation. Uh, so when I came uh, to HDS, I took half of my coursework outside of the Divinity School. Uh, I was uh, taking courses at the Kennedy School of Government, Harvard Business School, and Sloan School of Management, and I loved it. And uh, I, I, I fashioned my coursework around leadership, public policy, uh, and community-based ministry. And I was very informed uh, by uh, Dr. Preston Williams in the Summer Leadership Institute that he led. I worked for that a program after my uh, first year, um, after actually my second year at the Divinity School, my first year I went down and was a Congressional Black Caucus intern and I got to uh, work with Congressman Jesse Jackson Jr. And so uh, the work, uh, particularly at the Divinity School, the time there's a big talk around a charitable choice, uh, a project or program that Bush was uh, leading to have uh, faith-based institutions at that time uh, provide social services uh, to communities. Uh, and that was the big talk. That was my interest because it was marrying uh, my studies um, as a business student, as well as an aspiring theologian and you know community activist or somebody who just really wanted to be uh, entrenched in serving the people. And so uh, from there, uh, like most of my colleagues at the time, Harvard Divinity School was a haven for pre-professional work. If you weren't going into a PhD a program, you were going to medical school, uh, law school, and I found myself doing that. So I graduated from uh, the Divinity School and then went off to uh, law school uh, at the University of Iowa, where I was a law opportunity fellow, as well as a Thurgood Marshall fellow with the American uh, Bar Association. And uh, really enjoyed um, my time there. But I never turned my back on uh, the black church in particular. I grew up uh, in a mega church uh, down in Raleigh, North Carolina, from uh, Raleigh uh, area, served at a local parish in Cambridge. But then in Iowa, I served at the second oldest black church in the state in Cedar Rapids. And then after graduation, I served at the largest uh, black church uh, in Will County, Illinois, which is the second largest county in Illinois, after being licensed to practice law. Uh, in uh, the state of Illinois. And so um, the interesting thing was from growing up, uh, going to a, a very large church um, and then uh, transitioning to the Midwest and serving in large churches. Uh, and then after practicing uh, for a mid-sized Chicago law firm, uh, I really wanted to take my call to ministry seriously, more seriously at the time. And I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, secure at that time an internship working at Trinity United Church of Christ, which is the largest UCC church uh, or congregational church in the world, serving under the leadership of uh, Dr. Otis Moss III and uh, the church where uh, Dr. Jeremiah A. Wright Jr. is the pastor emeritus. And there I began to have fun in ministry. We began to imagine ways that we could uh, champion public policy, uh, do meaningful advocacy, and mobilize people and resources uh, to be the change that we needed to see. Uh, after a year, I was promoted to executive director, uh, started a freedom school, ultimately uh, started a few nonprofits, started CDC at the uh, first uh, Baptist church that I served at uh, out in Will County in Illinois, uh, taking the uh, knowledge that I uh, Garner learned at uh, Harvard Divinity School, in particular working with the Summer Leadership Institute, and said, "Hey, you are a large institution, you're a large black church, you have community presence. You should have a CDC to streamline uh, some of your resources or your assets, in particular real estate, uh, through this entity to serve our people more effectively and more efficiently." And from there. Um, after serving in Trinity for about six years, I started to be tapped by other uh, mainline denominations that wanted to benchmark and have a thriving uh, Black church uh, within their quarter, particularly in the uh, urban context of Chicago. And I uh, served uh, two congregations uh, within the Lutheran denomination. And once I left Trinity uh, to realize uh, a, a, a dream, if you will, or a challenge personally to be a senior pastor. I was recruited to serve in the United Methodist Church after being ordained Baptist and having privilege of call in the United Church of Christ. And to that end, uh, did doctoral work um, 
D-Men work, uh, really uh, leading a project on a uh, leadership or theological leadership incubator. And so what was happening is people were tapping uh, myself and a few other colleagues who are larger ministries in the city and thinking that if they brought us on to lead that we would grow those ministries as well. Unfortunately, that was not the case. Uh, but what we found is, is that in the urban context, amongst the mainline denominations, uh, the UCC, the Presbyterian Church, the American Baptist Church, um, not only were these urban churches uh, suffering from white flight, but they were also suffering from black middle class flight. So making sense of that, uh, we started a nonprofit, which first started out as the Zoe Network to uh, address uh, and uh, grow or revitalize urban mainline denominational black churches, particularly those that held them out as black congregations, not those that were predominantly black that were seeking to assimilate to a white standard. Big difference, right? Um, and then uh, we started and merged with uh, a nonprofit now within the United Methodist context as a subsidiary of a local chapter of uh, BMCR, Black Methodists for, for Church Renewal. And uh, we have uh, roughly uh, a half a million dollars worth of, uh, uh, of dollars uh, that is earmarked to this organization uh, for us to do meaningful church revitalization work within the black context of the United Methodist Church. So since leaving HDS, being open, uh, thinking that I was gonna go and be a high powered attorney uh, in some uh, business district uh, in one of the various cities, I'm still here in Chicago. I still practice law, I have my own practice, but I'm really committed to doing the work of the church to preserve uh, the black institutional church that is uh, committed to uh, championing a liberating gospel uh, for people of color uh, to build institution and preserve institution that we have a haven or a space where we can be ourselves unapologetically uh, proclaim our faith and empower people. And so um, that's what HDS uh, fueled me. And it happened in the classroom. It happened with the exposure uh, of uh, alumni who we were exposed to uh, early on uh, within our Sojourn Through courses, but more importantly, uh, working and staying connected with uh, classmates to encourage one another to realize their dreams, but more importantly, to do the work and do the work with a level of excellence and challenging the people that we work with who may be enamored with our background, our, our pedigree, if you will, um, to uh, just embrace new things, new ideas, dare to be different in an effort to uh, serve our community. Thank you so much, um, uh, Aaron, for, for sharing that with us and for your tremendous work at the intersection of faith and the law. And uh, we thank you for holding high that banner of, of service. And so we definitely appreciate that. And thanks to all of our panelists uh, for the exemplary conversation that we just had between one another. Um, we finished about three minutes early and we have 20 plus minutes for Q&A. And so we look forward to engaging your questions. Chavis? Chavis, um, yes. Mm -hmm. Chavis, I'm sorry, forgive me. I wanted just to give a special shout out to a name that was left out. She's here saying hello to Erin and I, Dr. Monique Moultrie. She was part of our class, uh, the class of 2002. Uh, she's a woman of distinction in her own right and has uh, followed the academic path. Really a very brilliant sister who's doing really great work. And she just told me now that she's the one who recommended Erin and I to this panel. I had no idea. And she's here watching today. So we just wanted to acknowledge her. Thank you, Dr. Monique. Thank you. That's amazing. And so you see, I mean, the Harambe connection and the thread of continuity remains throughout the years. And so that's ex exceptional to see how those things come into being. And so um, we look forward to those questions coming in. The first question I want to ask is how has your conception of the work evolved over time? And what does it mean to do the work right now? What does it mean for you to do the work right now? And so we understand the conference uh, theme around activism and, and black life. And we understand what's going on in our country right now, which is the very tip of the iceberg, the insurrections, the impeachments, all of those things. But what does it mean to do the work right now? And how has that evolved for you over time? Thank you. And any of you can answer uh, that particular question. I love your, you always ask very spicy questions right away, Chavis. <laughs> uh, I'll start. Um, there was a stark, the world really changed um, in 20, November, 2016. There was a 
overnight, it was a different time. And the world changed again uh, last month. And Black Lives Matter happened many, many times in between. And I think the approach has to be different now um, because there's a little bit more stability. Um, I always say that we can't react, we have to respond and respond requires preparation and deliberation. We always have to act deliberately and thoughtfully, um, which all my panelists, mashallah, have demonstrated so well. Um, yeah, it's just about being fearless and just saying like, you know, we are enough and it's, it's time that things really change. Um, without getting too political, uh, when I first immigrated to the States in 2002, things like universal healthcare was never a possibility. <laughs> things like these other countries do things better than we do and we need to change things so that people can actually have enough to eat, enough to, you know, close themselves, enough to, you know, a, a job. Those are very Christian principles that I don't think um, our political structure had really prioritized and even put on the table before now. Um, so I think in all of our respective fields and positions, we have an obligation to bring uh, that real helping of other people um, to the forefront. I can um, repeat something I said earlier that I've always seen my life in terms of like a book of chapters, you know, um, I'm going in one direction, but the work is gonna look differently every stage of my life that I'm in. So when I was a student, um, you know, we're not working, we're doing all that being a student entails, you know, the work meant fellowship with other people um, that look like us. It meant giving back in whatever capacity. I think since I've been in the eighth grade, I've been volunteering and being involved in community. You know, in high school, I was one of the founders of an organization in college. When I got to NYU, I started an organization. I was doing that as a student. Um, but now the work, I think I've seen, you know, the progression in terms of what we can do wherever we are. I even see teaching at the university as part of my work um, because it's making sure that I'm reaching out across generations. I just taught a class today for three hours at NYU. It was a course that I designed uh, called Political Social Work for Advocacy and Social Justice and Social Change. Um, I see that as my work because that's my obligation to teach others, to teach the new generation, to pass on what I know, to show them what's possible. But I also see now my work as trying to redress all of those ills in the past. You know, people here today have spoken about the last four years. Um, that has to be undone. Every generation has to fix whatever was done before. Um, so one of my bills was just signed into law by the governor, and I'll end on that note, the Central Park Five. Uh, Bill, uh, if you're from New York City, you know very well about the Central Park Five. It was a big case many years ago. Um, I was a little girl, so I don't remember it firsthand, but I certainly grew up hearing about it, where these uh, boys, uh, Black and Latino boys, were coerced into giving a false confession um, to say that they had uh, raped an, uh, a, a white woman in Central Park, which we knew years later they did not do, but it was way too late. They had all served jail time. So I, I co-sponsored this uh, bill with Senator Montgomery and the state legislature to make sure that whenever law enforcement is talking to our youth um, on you know, legal premises, family court, wherever, uh, precinct, et cetera, that those exchanges are video recorded. And it's something so small, it seems so simple and common sense, but these are the things that we need for our communities to protect our kids, to protect our youth. And I think, again, the work is just always wherever we are, we're in service, right? In whatever capacity we could do it. Thank you for that. I, I'll respond, Chavis. Um, I, your question is really good. And I'm thinking about it in a really broad sense. One of the things I thought a lot about while at HDS and I continue to think about it is uh, black liberation theology and the, the work of the late great uh, James Halcone. And particularly I'm always grappling with and thinking about his idea of what it means to be human. And as black folks, we live in a country that arguably still doesn't see us as fully human. And we know that part of the founding of the United States only dictated 
white land owning men um, as able to embody their full humanity. And so this has been a constant struggle of, of black folks, of, of immigrants, indigenous people, so on and so forth. And I think that black liberation theology is brilliant because it, it really charges us to think about what it means to be engaged in the, the human project and in the human struggle. And James Cone argues, and not argues, but he affirms that it means that we need to be a part of liberating work. We need to be a part of work in service and in struggle um, of freedom and full humanity. And when we fall short of that, or we engage in oppressive work, we're, we're not being fully human. We're not even being able to tap into our own humanity. Um, and that's one of the things I, I think a lot about in terms of whiteness. And I know I'm kind of going on a little bit of a tangent, but it's so interesting, especially nowadays in this, in this moment, in this kind of re-politicization around and, and, and woke culture, I see a lot of people throughout terms like white privilege um, in response to just not understanding like what it means to be black and not understanding the context of this country. And I often say, okay, yeah, that's a start. But really what I see a lot of white folks doing is not being in touch with their own humanity because they're complacent um, or because they're, they're able to, to, to so easily be a part of really oppressive and violent systems and perpetuate this sort of violence that falls short of honoring humanity. And so I say that all to say, I think part of doing the work, whatever that may be, is this is, is heeding the call of liberation theology. And I'm talking about it within the Christian context, but I think that liberation theology um, is something that permeates all religious traditions. And, and it's something that really speaks to the essence of humanity. And it's something that honors our full humanity. And it's a struggle to, to do that in this world when we're denied so many basic human rights, when we're denied our full humanity. And so, that's one of the things I thought a lot about, and I hope through this work um, that I'm doing that and I'm heeding that call. And I know that you know everyone on this on this on this call in their own ways and through their own work is is heeding that liberationist call. Without question, just echoing the, the sentiments of my dear sister. For me and the work that I do, if there's no liberation nexus or context, I wouldn't even do it. It wouldn't make any sense. Uh, we are to lift as we climb. We embrace Ubuntu. Um, this whole notion of uh, uh, of just innate, but more importantly, auth not innate, but authentic service uh, to people who we're in partnership or people who we are in fellowship with uh, to build stronger and safer communities, to be the replication or the uh, embodiment of the beloved community. Thank you for that question, for that answer, and those for those great answers there. I'm wondering, um, and we have some great questions that have come in uh, thus far. I'm wondering, in this moment when we're thinking about all of these high level things happening in our country and in our world, how do we deal with the issues that are beneath the surface? Pauli Murray, an often forgotten ancestor, her autobiography, her memoirs are titled Song in a Weary Throat. And I'm wondering how do we keep track of those voices, those who have been rendered most silent in society, those who have become most invisible in our society? How do you keep track of those individuals in your work? Um, how do you hear from them? And then how are you capable of broadening the horizons of your concern? How are you doing that on a daily basis and yearly basis, trying to keep track of those who are on the margins? What work do you do to stay connected to those at the bottom uh, or those on the margins? Oh, I started last time, and but because there's a lull, I'll start again. Um, this is gonna sound a little uh, pompous, but I have a feeling that just my mere presence in certain spaces that people like me learn expected to be or didn't deserve to be or weren't allowed to be. I think just me existing proudly and humbly and confidently, um, that already makes a big difference. Um, I've seen it in my work as a chaplain. I've seen it um, a couple of weeks ago too, we had our um, annual members only chaplains conference and I helped along with some others broaden the scope of what a Muslim chaplain looks like to people who don't know what our work is. And I have a feel, and I feel like in our own ways, everybody on this panel is doing that. Obviously it's not enough. You also have to speak up and speak truth to power, which I think is second nature to um, any of us. Um, but also living a long life. I mean, <laughs> um, or making every day that you're alive count. Um, I, I'll, I'll reframe that. 
Yeah. You know, um, serving with uh, Otis Moss uh, the third for eight years, he challenged me to embrace this concept of divine imagination, that we imagine the possibility of uh, seeing those, ourselves included, uh, living in a situation or living in a reality um, that we may not be able to realize now, but or, or conceptualize uh, in our current state. And so uh, to that end, I'm here. My, my church is in Washington Park uh, of Chicago. Uh, the way I live now is very different from the way that I grew up. Uh, my family, um, they were the integrators of uh, white neighborhoods and the badge of honor uh, in particular for my mother, who I love very much, is that, oh, we're the only Black family here and we have the biggest house. Uh, doesn't mean much today, uh, being that I live in a segregated community, uh, and the majority of uh, the clients who are served are African American. Uh, not all of them are resource challenged, but we live amongst each other. Uh, I'm feeding, or my church rather, uh, we are feeding people uh, on a daily basis, and our numbers of families who we fed have gone up in pandemic. Uh, we partnered with the uh, University of Chicago Woodlawn Charter High School uh, to feed indigent students there as well. So, um, but just not the, what I would call the simple things or the things that are easy for us to do, it's also imagining the harder things uh, to get done uh, to empower people who ordinarily would not come through our doors or who don't come through our doors now. How do we make ourselves relevant within the ministry context with people who don't um, or can't relate to high church or even to relate to good traditional black church. Uh, so uh, the continuous struggle uh, to be uh, relevant and to be effective and uh, sometimes do the work fighting through tears when you, you, you're, you're fighting through uh, the tongue lashing when people are mischaracterizing your motives and your agenda when the only thing you're trying to do uh, is help somebody along the way. Uh, so your living uh, is not in vain. Maybe one more answer on that question. We'll take both of you since you're both so generous. <laughs> no, I mean, I think anything that I would say uh, was just said by our, our dear brothers here. I mean, um, it's really our obligation. Uh, Naja talked earlier uh, which I'm sure resonated with a lot of us in terms of, you know, listening to the voices of our ancestors. I I often view myself as bearing that sort of personal responsibility as well, right? To convey to others those forgotten and marginalized voices. Like it's just incumbent upon us, and that's how we stay connected to the past. We have to always tell those stories. It's just it's a very personal thing for me, you know. Like I was raised in a household where when I was a little girl, you know, I understood like my my history. My father taught it to me, you know, I could talk to you about the, the West African slave trade and how we became Haitians, you know, we're not even native to the island of Hispaniola, we were essentially taken, we're the Dahomey people who were brought there to the Caribbean against our will and all of those things are very important. There's so many voices that have been forgotten about, so many freedom fighters. Uh, so many who fought for our liberation. It's just really our obligation to keep those voices uh, front and center and to remind every young generation, especially in our inner cities. I mean, if we talk about that, I'll get upset, but there's no real authentic black history of learning happening. And um, to live in a racially hostile society, which promotes propaganda of black inferiority, um, you know, they'll have us just but not with nothing in our heads, frankly, <laughs> we have to fill up the brains of black children with information that we want them to know. And that's how I see it. Nigel, we'd love to hear from you on this question as well. Um, I mean, I, everything that everyone has said, um, I think, how do we keep track of those on the margins? One of the things I often think about is this applies for folks who are currently in school, what it means to be at an institution, but not of the institution, um, that we can be um, students at Harvard, we can be alumni of Harvard, and that comes with real social capital, institutional access, um, proximity to whiteness and, and, and uh, money. But I think keeping track of our humanity and keeping track of the work that we do means that we don't become of Harvard. 
Um, and it allows me to stay committed to the values um, that drive what I do. Um, and, 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 you know, ex I'll just, for an example, my work um, with the Shabazz Center, one of the things I constantly think about is the way in which Malcolm X's legacy has sort of been shrouded in a sort of, um, a type of cultural nationalism that's rooted in many ways in patriarchy, massage noir, that hasn't historically made space for women, uh, queer folks, trans folks. And so what does it mean now to, to broaden the scope of Malcolm's legacy? So these voices, these analyses can be included in how we honor Malcolm um, and his work and how we activate it. Um, and so these are questions that I'm, I'm grappling with in real time. And you know I don't always have the answers, but as someone very close to just being having been a student at Harvard, um, I have to remind myself that I went there, but I am not of there. I'm from Harlem, so <laughs> yeah, that's what I would say. I, I love that response, uh, Naja, and I love the responses we've received thus far to this question. It's a very pertinent question. And I think keeping track of humanity is something that you highlight. We have to acknowledge that we were privileged to attend an institution like Harvard University. But when you think about broadening the scope of your concerns, the horizons of your concern, it can't be limited to, to people who look like us, experience things the way we do, but we have to keep mind, be mindful of folks who find themselves in categories that are other, queer folks, trans folks, people who are uh, immigrants and undocumented and undereducated who are overlooked in so many ways in our society and those who might be incarcerated and those beyond our national borders. We constantly as humans have to broaden the horizons of our concern. And so I issue that as a challenge to those listening that you would do the work of constantly pushing the boundaries of what you care about and what it means to be human and how you relate to those around you. And so as we enter our last question with our remaining minutes, uh, this is a question that's come up in the Q&A um, and prior to when we were discussing it. How do you keep track of your own humanity? How do you tend to your own soul? How do you take care of your own well-being? And what does your village look like that enables you to do that in some ways? And so uh, any of you can answer. I think we have about three or four minutes left. Chavis, I apologize. Um, I'm supposed to be at another event and I'm just texting people telling them to be patient. Um, I, I'd rather hear from others because I don't I don't really I'd be lying if I said that I have a, a, a regimen I don't I just do the best that I can. Um, one thing that I will say, though, for anybody out there watching who's interested in politics, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, I kind of grew up, you know, in Brooklyn, a big city, but like a small town girl, you know, very sheltered, very sort of like textbook, um, Haitian family, very, very sheltered and protective and was just really trying to like do the work and caring about my people. And then I got into this line of work and had to experience a lot of things uh, that till this day, I've never fully recovered from, you know, there's a lot of trauma involved just in running for office. Um, the sexism, the racism, the blatant um, oppression. Uh, a lot of people out there are not very happy uh, when Black people run for office, when we're trying to, you know, exert ourselves. And there's a lot of control behind the scenes with people who think that they know who should be in certain seats. And it's just made for a very um, emotionally traumatizing experience uh, and very toxic. So when you talk about taking care of myself, this experience that I'm talking about, it's like 24 hours, it's seven days a week. So I don't have the luxury to like, you know, plug, plug away um, unless if I get on a plane and go somewhere, uh, which my favorite place now is West Africa, by the way, I miss being able to travel very much uh, because of the pandemic. But a year ago, I was in a Senegal and Ghana and have been sort of my personal happiness now comes from traveling from country to country and that's what kind of calms me down with all the nonsense <laughs> that I deal with here uh, but can't do that now in the pandemic so I think it's just day by day deep breathing doing the things we like relying on friends family love and everything else. Thank you so much uh, a few more responses in, in the time we have remaining. I agree. Uh, oh sorry. Uh, uh, I'll just say my sentiments are very similar to uh, Mattel's. Um, balance is hard. Uh, and sometimes we uh, take it upon ourselves to be any and everything to everybody, but it's not worth it. 
while you're in school now, if, if you're a young alum uh, or, or whatever your connection is to the network, practice self-care. Um, things will get done, uh, breathe, drink water, uh, but it, it, it is, um, don't believe the hype. As our sister said, you know, um, our experiences are different. There is going to be stress. That first time that you learn that um, your Harvard degree in light of the person you are and the skin that you have takes on a different kind of dissertation for somebody who is white and male, that may be shocking because you have sacrificed a lot, um, you're given a lot and uh, racism is alive and very well. Um, but you all, or we all uh, have been um, pruned and um, encouraged and we, we've been through it uh, and been prepared to go and fight the battle. But sometimes you gotta take a, a break, uh, recharge yourself and go back. And uh, love is a great gift to give and to receive and uh, be in fellowship with like-minded people. Uh, so balance is something that I know I struggle with, but take my exhortation, uh, do it and do it well. Work at having balance because uh, you'll burn out. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, uh, Assemblywoman Mathilde, I know at least five people who are Senegalese who live in Harlem who would be happy to have you over for Senegalese food anytime. And um, as far as answering the question, um, as chaplains, we're really bad at this, okay? <laughs> but so now I feel like I'm finally able to take care of myself because I had been, I didn't realize this, but I had been carrying a lot of exhaustion and trauma from who was in office before January 21st. And I didn't even realize it, but it was weighing heavily on me. Um, now I feel like I can breathe again. I'm starting to bake again, which is something I love to do. Um, I also, um, you know, I'm going out to the gym regularly. It's double masked, of course, and I clean after every using everything because, you know, COVID. Um, but it's, yeah, it's been hard. It's been hard. Um, but just realizing that, um, again, I'm in this mode now where I just want to live peacefully and quietly. And so I do what I can to achieve that um, because if I don't, then I won't be able to help help other people. It's like, we all know this intuitively, but then doing it is really hard um, as my panelists have already said. Lastly, Nadja. Oh man, I'm just taking it all in because I just started working. Like I'm the baby on the panel. Um, honestly, self-care, like everyone said, it's hard to practice. It's easy to talk about. Um, at this point, for me, staying sane means investing in my skincare, investing in my hair routine, doing two deep conditioning treatments every week. Um, <laughs> for me, that's what it looks like uh, because it's hard and, and staying um, and, and not not feeling overwhelmed when, when you kind of, I, sometimes I spiral at night, you know, I think about the amount of time I've spent alone and how COVID, you know, might get someone that I know um, but I think it, what I've been realizing is it's in those moments of sort of um, releasing to the deep despair and um, grief that I feel that I, I find kind of the other end. And so just having grace for going through the motions, um, I think that we're all collectively experiencing of depression, grief, uncertainty, um, and recognizing that there's so much um, possibility on the other side to rebuild and to restructure the, the world that we really need to live in. And I know that's not necessarily self care, but that's a form of tending to this grief and tending to the, uh, the real life experiences that I feel um, of just so much uncertainty. Like this is not how I imagined being 26. I thought I was gonna have a club. I thought I was gonna have a boyfriend. Like it was different and this is not it, but I, I feel hopeful nonetheless. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful for that. And it's something that people like Cornell West, who I got to learn from at HDS taught, is, is sitting with the grief and it's in that, those moments of despair and grief that we feel faith and that we feel hope. Thank you all so incredibly much. This has been extraordinary uh, to just hear a piece of the stories of individuals who have done this exemplary work has been amazing. 
And so I hope that wherever you are, if you're a panelist uh, or if you're a person who's attending this, this panel discussion, that you will take up the channel of doing the work wherever you are, whatever that means to you, um, to understand that there's always work to be done and many hands make light work. And so the more of us engaging in the work of, of those on the margins and those who are um, often overlooked in society, the better off our world will be. So thank you all for these very important stories. And I look forward to, to the rest of this wonderful conference. And thank you all for, for creating this, for, this space for us to convene. Mm -hmm.